Every week, I get emails from people saying things like, Hey Rob, if DHT causes hair loss, then how come people with no DHT can still go bald? Hey Rob, this study shows that lowering inflammation regrows hair, so is inflammation the cause of hair loss? Hey Rob, if hair loss is genetic, how come one genetically identical twin can go bald faster than his brother? Hey Rob, can you review this Reddit post about pumpkin seeds? Hey Rob, does Prolactin cause hair loss because HMI-115 can regrow hair, I think. Hey, Rob. Hair loss is actually due to blood flow because monoxidil. What about scalp tension? Hey, Rob. F you and your scalp tension hypothesis. Hey, Rob. My cousin regrew his hair with olive oil. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. I love the engagement. I love the interest people are taking in these subjects. And I think these messages all hit on a much bigger question. What's the real cause of androgenic alopecia? And if the hormone DHT is the real cause, how come treatments that don't lower DHT can still regrow hair? The answer has to do with primary versus secondary factors involved in hair loss. The things that drive hair loss versus the things that accelerate it. In this video, we'll dive into these factors. We will clarify your biggest treatment targets. We will also reveal the best arguments for and the best arguments against popular hair loss theories online, including their rebuttals and the current scientific consensus. We will even give you a resource that does all of this work for you so that you can do away with all of the online straw man debates and actually formulate the best of the best arguments and counter arguments for any hair loss factor. That's coming up and it is all for free. In the world of hair loss, two things that sound contradictory can also be true. Consider the following. Bad diets and bad lifestyle choices can cause hair loss, and yet most people can't regrow hair with a perfect diet and perfect lifestyle. Inflammation causes hair loss. Most people can't regrow hair by lowering inflammation. DHT causes hair loss. People with no DHT can still go bald. So why do we know these things? Well. Studies on genetically identical twins show that one twin can go bald faster than the other. And the faster balding twin, they tend to be the one with higher degrees of stress, more divorces, more insulin insensitivity, a poorer diet. And so people hear about these studies on twins and they think, maybe they can reverse hair loss with a perfect diet and a perfect lifestyle. So they build that life for themselves. But two years later, their hair loss is still progressing. And if they'd only looked closer at those genetically identical twin studies, they would have realized something. Yes, twins do go bald at different speeds, but that's not the whole story. Because those studies also show just 8% of twin sets will show slight differences in hair loss late into adulthood. And while there are definitely outliers here, these levers for hair loss reversal, diet, lifestyle, environment, they tend to be really effective at normalizing hair cycling, reducing hair shedding in maybe those who have nutrient deficiencies or high stress. And yet they're not necessarily effective at reversing hair follicle miniaturization, the thinning of hair strands, the hallmark characteristic of androgenic alopecia in the average person with pattern hair loss. What does that mean? Diet, lifestyle, and environment are most likely contributors to androgenic alopecia. They're secondary factors involved in the progression, but they're probably not the root cause. And so their ability to reverse hair loss by themselves is, on average, going to be limited. And yes, studies show that lowering inflammation can regrow hair. Not just in one cherry-picked study on people with nondescript hair loss types. I'm talking about in people with androgenic alopecia. Topical cetirizine lowers histamine reactions in the scalp. And studies show that topical cetirizine consistently regrows hair. Topical latanoprost alters prostaglandin activity, an inflammatory substance derived from fatty acids. Many studies show that that can regrow hair. And ketoconazole shampoo is an anti-inflammatory, antifungal medication, with five studies showing it can regrow hair. So should we all reverse our hair loss by lowering our inflammation? Well, if you look closer at the studies, you realize that these anti-inflammatory topicals, they're actually really hit or miss. They work amazing for some people, they don't work at all for others. 
Across studies, their response rates are relatively low, probably because these treatments tend to be more appropriate for people with subset types of androgenic alopecia. For cetirizine, that's people with high mast cell degranulation or histamine-like responses in their scalp. That's not everybody with androgenic alopecia. It's a portion. For latanoprost, that might be people with altered prostaglandin activity. And studies have shown that prostaglandin activity in balding regions is not nearly as consistent as we thought it was in 2012 and 2014, especially across genders and stages of loss. And for ketoconazole, that could be people with inflammation, not general inflammation, but that that is caused by microorganisms. Because the antifungal shampoo will kill off those microorganisms, lower levels of inflammation that they produce and thereby improve hair cycling. And that's really only appropriate for maybe 30 to 50% of people with androgenic alopecia who also have these microorganisms. And for those who don't have these microorganisms or who don't have oily scalps, the shampoo might actually do the opposite. Instead of improving your hair, it can dry it out, make it feel fried, maybe even increase hair shedding. So what does this all tell us? It says, yes, lowering inflammation can and will regrow hair, but not for everybody. It depends on what's causing that inflammation, how you target it, and your specific scalp environment. And finally, yes, the hormone dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, causes androgenic alopecia. We know this because men who don't produce DHT don't go bald later in life. Injecting men with testosterone, which then can become DHT, stimulates hair loss. And studies on thousands and thousands of men show that DHT reducing drugs like finasteride and dutasteride can slow, stop, and even partially reverse androgenic alopecia in 80 to 90% of the men who try it. And that the hair gains can sustain two, five, even 10 plus years into the future. And yet, Androgenic alopecia can also occur in children, kids who barely have any androgen levels or DHT at all, and sometimes no familial history of hair loss. It can occur in women with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. In other words, women who have no androgen activity because the androgen receptors are missing. They have no ability for androgens to attach to cell sites and influence their behavior. In fact, women with Androgenic alopecia also tend to see far less robust treatment responses to DHT-lowering drugs like finasteride. This also is probably true for men who lose hair in female pattern hair loss presentations diffusely, but with retention of the hairline. For these reasons, researchers now suspect that androgenic alopecia in men and female pattern hair loss, they might have overlapping pathologies, they're probably separate hair loss disorders. And on the female pattern hair loss side, Hormones like DHEA sulfate, cortisol, prolactin, and IGF-1 are potentially more involved in those cases than in straightforward cases of Norwood Hamilton androgenic alopecia. So can we look at these cases of people with androgenic alopecia and little to no DHT and say, hey, this proves DHT isn't the cause of hair loss? No, just like with hair loss's relationship to scalp inflammation or with diet or with lifestyle or with environments, Context matters. And in this context, these causes of hair loss here do not provide a basis to negate the evidence on DHT and hair loss here. We could do this same exercise with any potential contributor to hair loss. Blood flow, genetics, fibrosis, scalp tension, calcification, you name it. And you will find studies that build a case for their involvement and studies that build a case against their involvement. And the truth is that because everyone's hair loss situation is different, you will also find people both succeeding and failing across all treatment targets. People who will see major success by lowering DHT and people who will see continued hair loss after lowering DHT. People who see tons of regrowth after lowering inflammation, people who see a worsening of hair loss after lowering inflammation. People who see a lot of hair regrowth with dietary lifestyle and environmental changes and people who see no changes whatsoever. People who see regrowth on natural interventions that don't target DHT, people who tried the same exact intervention and it didn't work for them at all. These dueling realities have created, in my opinion, a growing level of hostility in hair loss forms where people organize into camps. One camp does not believe that DHT causes hair loss and they point to the studies I just referenced and success stories outside of DHT reduction as evidence that hair loss can happen without DHT as can hair regrowth without lowering DHT. The other camp, 
thinks that those people are crazy. They point to the evidence supporting DHT's role in hair loss, the response rates, and the regrowth rates of DHT-lowering drugs. And then they deny the reality of their opposition by saying that their hair regrowth is probably a lie. Or maybe they tear apart their before and after photos to a standard they would never apply to before and after photos from a finasteride user. And the justification is because the evidence quality on finasteride is so incredibly high. And of course, we know it works. And all of that is fair and true. And yet it's also true that randomized controlled trials show that people can regrow hair without lowering DHT. So for anybody watching this video, I would like to invite you to avoid picking sides in the world of internet tribalism. Instead, let's recognize the truth on both sides of the aisle. This truth can be best contextualized in the framework of primary versus secondary factors in hair loss. For most men with androgenic alopecia, the primary factors are going to be interactions between our genes and the hormone DHT. And targeting DHT will generally lead to the highest response rates, the biggest hair gains, and the longest lasting hair regrowth. And yet there are still secondary factors involved in androgenic alopecia. And for people whose situations involve lots of secondary factors driving their hair loss, or maybe even just one big secondary factor that's a part of their hair loss, then when those people target those secondary factors, even outside of DHT, they will also see hair regrowth. And that can be true, and simultaneously, it can be true that targeting the secondary factors, on average, is very hit or miss, and generally doesn't work consistently. I see this context get left out of the discussion all the time. And I hope that by watching this video, people can begin to see truths that exist simultaneously. These ideas are not mutually exclusive, and the existence of regrowth outside of DHT reduction does not negate the importance of lowering DHT for improvements to androgenic alopecia. To help with the education surrounding these concepts and to help people understand the differences between primary versus secondary factors involved in hair loss, we have spent the last few months building something that does all of this work for you. It is an interactive guide that for any factor related to hair loss, does away with the straw man debates online, and instead builds you the strongest scientific arguments and the strongest scientific counter arguments for that factor's involvement in hair loss and hair growth, including rebuttals and what the current scientific consensus is. We also have given ranks for each of these factors' viabilities. A score of three means that it's a primary target. A score of two means that it is a secondary factor or accelerator. A score of one means that there's not yet enough data to support a connection. Prioritize the threes. You will maximize your chances and your magnitude of hair regrowth by doing so. And if you want, dive into the evidence on each factor, its arguments, check out the studies so that you can understand exactly how this scientific consensus is reached. We are going to regularly update this very guide with more factors, and we're going to prioritize the ones that people want us to most explore. So feel free to check out the free guide, get a better understanding of the causes of hair loss, the complexities of these arguments, and if you want, request new factors for us to analyze. Do it in the guide itself or in the comments below. We will prioritize the ones with the highest numbers of votes. So. Whenever you see a new study about an unconventional way to maybe improve hair loss, or maybe a new product advertised that's targeting a novel hair loss mechanism, visit this guide. Know what sort of impact that factor might have on the average person with androgenic alopecia, and use that to make more informed treatment decisions so that you don't waste time, money, or hair. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that it helps enhance your education on these topics, perhaps makes you a more informed consumer, and I hope that this free guide, which you can access below, will help you make better treatment choices. See you next time.